taking the time to come and hear me chat to you. Um, you may think, oh, there's not many people here. It never worries me. I've spoken to one or two people and I've spoken to thousands of people. And every single time I speak to someone, an audience or a group, someone will go away and think, I might change X, Y, or Z about my life or think about that. And the ripple effect goes out and um, hopefully good vibes and good things spread outwards. So thank you for coming. So the screen behind me will contain all sorts of pictures that helps to highlight and illustrate the journey I have been on. And I was once just like you sitting in auditoriums listening to people tell me about their adventures. And I often thought, sounds wonderful, but it's not something I could ever really do. But it's not true. We are all ordinary and absolutely extraordinary. Every single one of you has some special magic inside of you that nobody else in the whole world has. So it's up to you to dig deep and find that magic, bring it alive, and then make an incredible life for yourself. So before we begin, I just want to get your mind in the right place and to think about some things. So the first thing is, have you ever managed to achieve something that you never thought you'd be able to? Maybe it's when you were younger in PE class, you did a long jump further or ran a race further than you thought. Maybe you got a grade that you didn't believe you could possibly get. It could have been anything. But I want you to think, just for a couple of seconds, find something in your mind where you've really impressed yourself. And hold it there for a second. You've all got one. And then the next thing is, is there something in your future that feels currently unachievable? Could be to do with school and grades, could be to do with universities, it could be to do with the kind of career you would like to have, where you would like to live, anything at all. But we also all have something we think, oh, I'd love to do. No, but it's not me. It definitely could be you. And then the last thing is when things get really tough, and all of us have faced some significantly tough things lately, COVID has made life very difficult. Uh, can you hear me okay? Because the microphone seems to be in and out. Is it sounding away right with you guys? Yeah. Uh, shall I see what it's like without? Because we haven't got lots of us. How are you without it? Is that okay? Yeah. Yeah? It's kind of a bit better than the echo we might have heard. Yeah? Okay, fabulous. All right, so I feel a bit better because I can waggle my arms around now. A bit more me. Okay, so um, when times get tough, do you have coping strategies? Sometimes when times are tough, you have a solution. Great, but a strategy will be something that gets you through any kind of tough time. So I have a few strategies I use, I've been through quite a few tough times, and come out of it the other side, you might be tired, you might feel broken, but you can still thrive and you'll still smile again and times will be great, the sun will come out and everything will always be okay in the end, no matter what you're facing. So, here we go. That's me! Um, obviously that's me. I live by the sea and I thought I'd put some pictures in there just to give you a little bit of a sense of who I am and what I'm all about. So in the middle, me, I love my bright colours, pink and blue have always, uh, pink, blue and yellow have always been my, my sunshine colours. When I'm feeling sad, that's where my go-to. I like the blue sky and the sunshine and the blue sea so it all fits together. On the left you have me hiking with my friend Chris Hallinger in Cornwall. Um, below that, I'm sea swimming in that. It was last year in the winter, and the sea was maybe 8 degrees, um, very cold. And uh, I'm wearing a woolly hat, gloves, boots, and a full wetsuit. This year in the winter, just before I flew out here, I'm in just my swimsuit in the same temperature water. So it shows you what a year can do. Last year, I, my friends were like, take the wetsuit off, try it. I was like, oh my goodness, no. I cannot scream in cold. This year, no problem. I just sashay to the sea in my swimsuit, and everybody else goes, how do you do that? Just a little bit of perseverance. At the bottom, you can see Cornwall, which is where Kate and I also, we, we live really close to this beach, so Miss Mosquera, sorry. Um, that's where we uh, met, and it's a very beautiful outdoorsy place. Uh, I've also been driven around the island a little bit, and you live in a gloriously beautiful place too. What a fabulous place this is. In the centre at the bottom is me signing copies of my first book late last year at Cheltenham Literary Festival. Um, and on the right is the cover of the book that I have written called Unlost. And there's a picture of a puppy. Uh, and the picture of the dog is quite important because I've always wanted a dog 
And for a long time, I couldn't have a dog, not because of allergies or anything like that, but because I was really sick. I didn't start off sick, I was very healthy, very robust, rowed a uh, stroke rower for the sliding seat rowing team at my university, and later on at other clubs, was a runner, a swimmer. But um, I was told when I was in my teens that I probably would be in a wheelchair by the age of 40, that chronic pain would catch up with me, that the way my body was put together wasn't great, and although I felt good at the time, in later life I would struggle and be in a wheelchair and lose the ability to walk. And so I didn't believe that at the time. I was only 14 and didn't really take it in. You know how you are when you're that age, you go, oh yeah, right, whatever. Um, and I tried to live a normal life, and I did for a long time, and then I got very poorly. And I was very poorly for about 15 years. And so having a dog now, I got a dog last year, means to me that I can commit to an animal that needs me to move and walk and take it outside for long treks, for hikes, and because I was ill for such a long time, it would have been unkind and unfair to have an animal to take on adventures with me, and hiking long trails. So having the dog is a really great symbol that I believe in my own health and that I will stay well for a long period of time. So this is all me looking fabulous, having a great time. But this, as I said, is also me. About 15 years ago, big black eyes, very kind of unwell, cri crippled in demeanor, as well as physically, not able to do very much at all. So as I said, I was told I'd lose the ability to walk. I went on and had a great time at university, trained for my PGCE. And it was when I was training with Miss Moskwa uh, for my PGCE that the pain first started to creep up through my right hand side, through my leg, through my hip and my neck. And I thought, it's just brain. I've been in the gym, I've worked too hard, so I stopped going to the gym so much. It didn't get better. I went to the doctors eventually and said, I'm in pain all the time and it's really bad and I can't lift my leg properly, it's not very strong anymore. Just a little bit of back pain. Everybody has a little bit of back pain these days, you know, the way we live, the way we work, computers. And I said, okay, all right, must be, must be that. I'll try harder. So I would do Pilates, a bit of yoga, strengthen my core. Didn't really help. So over the next few years, I gave up lots and lots of things. I gave up going to the gym, I gave up my rowing club, I gave up going out dancing with my girlfriends, I gave up exercise classes, and the pain just got worse. I still taught because being a teacher was one of the greatest things that I've ever had the privilege of doing, working with young people, listening to their stories, helping them learn to flourish and shine, was so great for me that I didn't want to give that up. I may have given everything else up, but I took the painkillers from the doctor every day and dragged myself to school, taught classes. Um, I was, like Miss Moscow, a history teacher by trade, had then head of faculty, then leadership team, so I had great responsibility in large schools. But I'd get home from a school day, you don't see teachers' lives when they get home. You imagine them to be only existing when you are in school, and then after school they maybe just vanish into the ether. But this particular teacher, I would drag myself out of the car, I'd have to lift my legs out of the car with my arms, um, I would avoid going to the supermarket when it was busy in case anybody nudged me with their trolley because even the slightest movement on my body would cause agonizing pain. And sometimes I'd have to take myself to shower in the morning out of bed by my arms only along the floor until the painkillers I would take when I woke up would make me feel able to use my legs. And I didn't tell anybody apart from my immediate family how much I was struggling and the doctor. But the doctors didn't have any answers. So I was not socialising, I wasn't seeing anybody, I was only working. But because I was working, people believed I must really be fine and either just a bit miserable or a bit sad. My friends thought I was standing them up, not turning up to their dinners, not coming to their birthday parties, not coming to their children's birthday. Why is Gail not coming? She's at work, so she can't be sick. But when you have an invisible illness, when you're suffering from something chronic that people can't see, like a broken leg or a broken arm, it's very difficult to keep explaining to people that you're struggling. It's very difficult to remind people constantly um, actually, I'm not very well, even though I look well. So I disappeared inside myself over a period of years, and eventually the doctors sent me to something called the pain clinic, where really they go, 
We don't know what's wrong with you. We've given you MRI scans, CAT scans, you've had this medication, that medication, and there's no answers. So after about eight or nine, maybe 10 years, I ended up in this clinic, and they said, Miss Muller, we appreciate that you've tried really hard to find out what's wrong with you. We appreciate that you're angry and you're struggling. We, we need to tell you to give up hope now. Because the hope that you are feeling means that you will never accept where you're, where you're at and your life will never be peaceful. So give up hope. Take all these medications we're giving you. Stop refusing them because they make you sleepy or you can't drive or you get a dry mouth or bad dreams. Take them. They will decrease the pain. Apply for a disability badge for your car. Get ready to hand in your notice and lose your job because you won't be able to function. You'll probably lose your mobility. And just start working with us about acceptance. For me, that was some of the most shocking things I've ever heard because I believe that you can have hope and acceptance at the same time. You can accept where you are, that you're facing struggle, whether it's family trauma, personal trauma, physical illness, grief. You can accept it, but you can always hope at the same time that tomorrow might be better, or later today might be better, or next week someone will find a way to be able to cure whatever you're going through. So I said to the people at the pain clinic, I'm sorry, but I don't want to be treated by you anymore. I don't want these medications. My body used to work really well. I used to run, row, windsurf, or I'll pretend to windsurf. I wasn't very good, but I tried, tried surfing. And now I can do barely nothing. So if my body used to work, then there must be a way to find out why it doesn't and fix it so that it works again. And they said, it doesn't really work. And I said, well, I'm going off by myself, and I'll find my own way of fixing myself. So I left the pain clinic, discharged myself, and I decided to look all over the world for different solutions and cures to what was making me poorly. I fasted in the Thai jungle for 12 days in a row, did that twice, no food at all. Um, transcendental meditation, pilates, zero balancing, uh, craniosacral therapy, yoga, swimming, working out, weight training, all kinds of remedies, herbal and otherwise. And everything helped a little bit, but nothing helped a lot. And my life quality was very low, yet still I was working. And I was working so well at my job, because that's where I put every iota of energy, my relationships disappeared, um, you know, but my job, my job wasn't everything to me. So I was then seconded, taken by the British government, and given to the European Commission in Europe as a representative of excellence in British teaching for a job for the Commission. And they put me in a school in Italy. Now, I looked like a split personality. You had 90% of my time was spent managing my pain, struggling, trying to eat right, taking herbal pills, trying to do Pilates trying to not cry every day when I had to drive my car and use my foot on the accelerator. 10% of my life, I was in front of the classrooms being rather brilliant, students having a great time. So I was living a double life, managing because I had family around me, friends, a routine, ways to cope. I took the job and I went to Italy and I had none of the structure that I'd built around myself to keep myself together. Um, I took the job because I needed to feel like I was still worth something, that my skills were more than my illness, that I could still help people even though I was going under the waves. But I got there and I very nearly died. I very nearly got to a point where I couldn't cope, I couldn't move, I couldn't thrive at all. In a, in a place where I couldn't speak the language, miles from my family, miles from my doctors. And it was there, in that place, in my lowest moment of my entire life, in the winters, in the snow, at the top of a mountain in Italy between Lake Maggiore and Lake Como, that I found the solution that changed my life, when everybody else had basically said, you've got to give up hope. So, here, on the shores of Lake Como in northern Italy, was a man who knew something that nobody else that I'd met knew. I've been offered so many different solutions. Oh, it's because your feet turn in from where, when you were born. Oh, it's because you've got a chubby, chubby tummy and you haven't got enough muscles in your tummy to keep yourself upright. Oh, it's a bone condition. Your nervous system's no good. Oh, you've got bulging discs in your spine. 
a million different solutions get very confusing because they all have a million different ways of dealing with them and none of them work. So when I was at my very lowest ebb, I found a phone number in my wallet from my chiropractor in England when I was about to give it all up. And it said, call this number if you ever get in a really bad way. I saw this man at a conference, he was wonderful. I turned the card over and I thought, do I bother? Do I bother trying to see another person after 15 years or 12 years of this horrific situation or do I just give up now? And I thought, one last thing. I'll try one last thing. So I phoned him. They got me in the next day. He did what lots of chiropractors do. He's a specialist chiropractor from Belgium, Belgian-American. He does the thing where you lie on the, on the bed and he tests your strength of your arms and your legs and says, oh, we could crack you here. And then he did something with my jaw, made me chew on different bits of cotton wool and then walk and then come back. It was all very bizarre. And afterwards, he sat me down and said, Gail, I could treat you every three days for the rest of your life and you'd feel okay. You'd never get better. And I would charge you 90 euros every single time and you'd go bankrupt. Because what is wrong with you is something in your jaw that I can only improve temporarily but that a dentist can fix permanently. And I said, I don't believe you. I heard so many stories about what was wrong with me. I just didn't believe that something else could be true. He said, I'll send you downstairs to the dentist I work with. We are an emerging science across the world at the moment. We are spearheading it. Go down, have your head x-rayed in this huge machine. Let me show you what I mean. So I thought, oh, what's, the op what's the other option at the end? So downstairs I went, they put my head in this big machine, they put the big scans up on the screen and they showed me. And part of my combo joint in my jaw, this side is not shaped the same as this side. And it means that my jaw is slightly wonky, just slightly, which means my teeth don't meet correctly. Minuscule difference in how my jaw sits. And he said, you can have braces for two or three years, we can do a lot of intervention, change how your teeth sit in your mouth, change how they move, to represent as if you have correct jaw, and that will change your life. And he said, it will be a two and a half year commitment, it will be a lot of money, it will be a lot of pain, there'll be a lot of time, but the other side of it will be worth it. And I thought, okay, another thing. And he started treatment with me, and it worked. Within six months, I was in even more agony, said, trust me, trust me, we'll turn a corner, big braces, had to wear things in my teeth, tightening it every other week. And then, on the other side of those horrendous six months, I started to improve. Less pain, pain receding up my leg, pain receding up my arms. I started to be able to walk further, I could walk to the supermarket, to the cafe in the morning rather than driving in Italy. Then I could start to walk in distance. Then I started running, I could run half a mile, then a mile. Then I phoned up some people who did gym stuff back at home in Cornwall and they worked online with me while I was in Italy teaching me to lift weights up to start building all of these muscles that had just failed because I wasn't using my body. And after about a year, I could do things like everybody else. I didn't quite believe it. I kept thinking I was going to get sick again. But I kept thinking, actually, no, why not trust in this? Why not have the hope that I had all these years that I never gave up? Just extend that for one more year. See where I can go. See where I can go. And it took me to incredible places. So I decided, once I realized I was properly well, I still have neuropathic pain, because when you've had pain for that long, your brain creates pathways. Um, so when I brush my teeth, you know you brush your teeth and it slips and you hit your gum and you go, oh, that really hurts. I feel that here first. Then I feel it here, then I feel it in my mouth. If I stub my toe, I feel it here, here, then my toe. Because my brain's pathways are so strong for this area of pain that that's where they send any pain. Emotional pain, heartbreak, a big argument with my sister. I feel pain here and here before I feel any other pain. It's very strange what the brain can do, but I can do great physical things. So when I healed my body, I thought, what's the hardest thing I think I can do to see if my body really works? All these years I've been denied physical activity. How can I really do something physical? I think I'll go and hike the Appalachian Trail. Hands up if you've ever heard of the Appalachian Trail. Okay, so it is the longest footpath only trail in the world. So you're not allowed to take horses on it and you're not allowed to ride bicycles on it. Some other huge trails in the world, you can do both of those things. This is only for your feet. 
and is 2,200 miles long. It changes every year because sometimes trees fall down, sometimes there are big rock falls or floods that wash away bits of the trail so they have to reroute it around a mountain or through a different part of the forest and they measure and they change the mileage by one or two miles every year. It is from the north in North America, you can see the picture of North America on the screen. Up at the top is Maine and at the bottom of that red line where it ends is Georgia. Most people go up northbound, I chose to go south the hard way, the really hard way. So you have maybe two and a half thousand people every year now, it's very popular, try and go north, and they all start together at the same kind of few weeks, and they all have their backpacks on, and up they go, and about 250 go south, because it is really hard, and of that, only about 25% ever make it all the way through, and of that, only about 7% are winning. So I thought, yeah, go the hard way, make it really cold, make it really fierce, and I'll be a girl and I'll pretty much go by myself, see what happens. Because what could be worse than what I've been through? I'm so grateful for my body, I'm so grateful to be alive. I'm so grateful to still have hope and resilience after all I've been through. Let's go and push it and see what I can do next. It is one of the most challenging trails in the world. It's very tough terrain. So it's through 14 states of America, through national parks, across mountain ranges. And it's called the Appalachian Trail because you're going across the Appalachian Mountain Range all the way. So it's a lot of ups and downs. And when they made the trail, they decided to make it as hard as they could. So you can see when you hike it, there are routes that go around the peak, nice and quick and flat. And there's the Appalachian Trail, which goes uh, over the peak and down the other side and joins the flat bit. You've got to carry on and go over the hard bit. So, you can see there are some things that you might encounter on the trail there. Bears, snakes, rattlesnakes, yeah, yeah. All these things that you don't get in England that I was suddenly immersed in the middle of, in the deep woods with thousands of miles of forest all around me. Hard to get out when you're in. So, here you can see the elevation profile of the Appalachian Trail. Now for a really fit person, it's hard. But for somebody who was immobile, pretty much, for years and years, who wasn't confident enough to move my body, this is unbelievably difficult. You can see, um, this is a southbound profile, so on the left you start with Mount Katahdin, you can just about see that writing on the left. Then, on this map it's highlighted New Hampshire, the state of New Hampshire, which is very difficult. All of those spikes are peaks of mountains you have to climb up and down. So it's not like walking around, I mean, I've, I've looked a bit at Bahrain, there's not a lot of elevation here, is there? There's not a lot of climbing up and down. If you go running, it's pretty flat. This is my involvement. This is day one. You can see on the left, that's day one, up that peak. I, before I went on this adventure, where I slept in my tent for six months and carried everything with me in my backpack, I never stayed in a tent for more than three nights in a row. Ever. So I was so far out of my comfort zone, carrying everything I needed with me, my water filter, because you'd have to drink from streams along the way, no shops. You drink from streams, but you don't know what's died in the stream further up the mountain. It could be a dead moose that's died and fallen across the stream and is rotting up there in the summer. But the water that comes around the corner looks crystal clear, because you've no idea there's a dead animal, a dead boar, whatever it might be. So you have to filter all the water that you drink and carry the filter with you. So if you're thirsty, it's work. You have to work for your water. First you have to find your water, you have to use maps to see where streams are, you might have to hike off trail to find a spring or a stream, then you have to fill up a pouch or a bottle, then you screw your filter on, squeeze the water through the filter into another bottle, so you can have a drink. Everything is effort, so you start to feel grateful for every single thing you have. When you get to a town and you turn on the tap for the first time after a week in the woods, you go, this is so easy, fill up your cup. Thank you. Um, yeah. And you have to carry all the food you need with you as well. You can't get out easily. You have to wait until you pass a dusty road. The trail will eventually pass a dusty logging road or a hunter's road. Walk to the end of that road. Wait. Hitchhike until somebody lets you sit in the back of their pickup truck. Then they'll drive you to a crossroad somewhere to a tiny town where you'll go into a gas station and buy yourself some food for the next three or four days and maybe have a Diet Coke. Amazing. And then you hitchhike back to the trailhead, pack back on, back into the beach you go for another five days with all of your food and water. You've got to calculate the food, right? 
Because you use so many calories a day, hiking four, five thousand calories a day, hiking fifty thousand steps a day, and you have to carry all your food in your backpack. The middle picture, I look like I've just hiked a very long way. Day one. That's day one. <laughs> because I was going the opposite direction to most people. That's when most people finish. So it's a brilliant sign on top of Mount Katahdin. But I, yes, was just starting. And on the right hand side, can't see it very clearly from where you are, but that's called the hardest mile of the Appalachian Trail. It's called the Mahusik Notch, and it's a one mile gulf, gully, full of boulders from a glacier. So you have to climb over the boulders, under the boulders, and it takes for one mile, sometimes three and a half hours to get through. And I did it in July, I think it was probably July, it's hot, mosquitoes, thick, humid air, and then you climb down a few boulders, and it was such a deep crevice that they ice still underneath your feet and then you climb back up and it would be sweltering mosquitoes and down to the ice. It was very bizarre and very hard. When I finished that section I just lay on the floor and cried. It would be a 22 mile day ending in that and I couldn't go anywhere. I just lay crying in the dust. So I don't know if we are able to play and have volume. Do you know if we have volume? Anyone know? Ooh, nobody you have to ask. Mm. Let's see. Mm. I'm not trying to be funny. But this boy who is pretty intimidating. They want to make sure you just go straight up. They don't actually see who I am. And you're like, never been able to do anything like this since I was in my early 20s so I just was like any minute now I'm gonna have to give up again like every marathon I ever tried to train for triathlon I always had to give up because of the pain not this time so the first hundred miles this is another reason why it's so hard because if you go southbound the first 100 miles is genuine wilderness it's actually 118 miles so there's only dirt logging roads that nobody really uses. You can't easily get you out. Not even a helicopter can easily medevac you out because it's thick forest in the mountains. So once you go in, you are committed. <laughs> once you are in, you really can't get out until you get out the other side. I did it with a friend, the first bit, who wanted to come and support me for the first little section, Alice. Um, she didn't have a great time for the first bit. I think she thought it would be Neither of us knew it would be as hard as it was that first section. You can see Alice in the middle. She has two poles in the river. She's already fallen in that river twice. And this is her third attempt to get over these slippery rocks. Bear in mind, though, that wet clothes and bumping yourself in a river sounds bad. But it sounds especially bad when you have another eight days without a change of clothes and you only have another pair of leggings in your bag for sleeping in when it's cold. So that's all you've got to wear. If you're wet, you stay wet. It chafes your legs, it chafes your legs. It was really hard. On the right hand side, you can see a girl in a pink top. We were wearing those mosquito head nets because there were so many black flies and mosquitoes. You couldn't see if you took them off. They flew into your eyeballs and up your nose. So you had to wear that all the time. It was sweltering humidity. She um, 
she didn't make it, well, she, she's still alive, but <laughs> she didn't make it uh, any further than the 100 mile wilderness because she packed too much food, her pack was too heavy, she didn't wear sunscreen, and she burnt and blistered all of her face on the first day and then went into the wilderness, so it got infected, she hurt her foot, she got, oh, I had 86 mosquito bites by day two, she had even more, and she drank some bad water on the first day because she did, it looked so pretty, she didn't think she had to filter it. So she had a tough time, um, and because if you're hiking your own hike, you can't look after people, you have to leave people behind. As long as they're not struggling and they need evacuation, if people are slowing down and feeling tired and wanting to take a bit of a nap, you don't know these people. Uh, you know them because you meet them on the trail, but you make friends knowing that you're friends, but you are still alone. You're alone together. You make groups of friends as you hike, and you will help them as much as you can. But if they say, I've got a tummy bug, I need to go to a motel for the night, or I need to sleep in this morning, you can't sit and wait for them, because you've got another 2,000 miles to hike, and a budget, and a walking pace, and other people you like to hike with too. So you have to say, I'm so sorry, maybe I'll see you in a few days. And you might never see them again. And because people have trail names, um, my trail name is Hot Mess, so um, you have trail names that are about what you do or silly things you might have done. Um, you never really know people's real names. So this girl, we spent days and days with, uh, but I, once she disappeared and we didn't see her again, I, I don't know how to find her in the world. So it's a very bizarre environment where you make really deep bonds with people because you have to rely on people for sharing food or water if you're in trouble. But then if they disappear, they're gone. You might walk faster than somebody one day that you met, that you've hiked with for three or four weeks. You hiked every day, you chatted on the trail when you see them at the river or the stream, at a campground at night. And then one day, you get up late, they hike a little bit faster than you that day because they feel strong and they want to do an extra five miles. You never catch up with them. They might be seven miles ahead of you, eight miles for the whole rest of the trail, and you just never see them again. It's kind of bizarre. Um, yes, you've got the head net there. But yeah, this is on the other side of the 100 mile wilderness. This is where I'm into the real trail, um, where you're just mountains, valleys, mountains, valleys. And I'm crying in that picture because it's taken me hours to get to the top of this mountain. And I thought that there would be a town right on the other side. And you can see that there's no town. It's like a whole nother couple days hiking until I can get to somewhere that has a shower where I can wash my body and my clothes. You, you can see my leg, how filthy and cut up I am. Blisters, blood, cuts, bruises. It was very brutal, but you know what? Every single blister I got, every bruise, every morning when I woke up in my tent on the hard floor and had to get up and go, oh, I can't walk for the first 20 minutes of the day, I was so happy because it wasn't chronic pain. It wasn't that condition I'd had for 15 years that had me lying in my bed crying. These were real people injuries. These were things people got from trying to do tough stuff, from being outdoors, from being brave, from being wild. So I never complained about my blisters or my bruises or my cuts. I was just solidly grateful for them because it meant I was living my life. Um, the mountains that we were in was an incredible adventure in itself. This is my friend Hamburn and I. We realized um, from some books we'd read that a plane had gone down on one of the mountains in the 1950s. And because it was so high up in the mountains, people could never recover the plane fuselage and the, the wreckage. Um, so we went off trail with maps and compasses and, and our apps, and we managed to find the wreckage of the plane in the mountain. This is not on a trail. We had to bushwhack out to, to find it. Um, and we very respectfully looked at the wreckage. It's, it, was a, it was a sad place to see because the plane had crashed in the 50s and the people on board had survived the crash. The pilot had really carefully managed to get it down off the side of the mountain, through the trees which had cushioned it a bit, it broke up, but the people inside were alive, but they needed help. But because back then communication systems weren't very good, by the time the message had got to the villages and towns below in the main um, kind of area, they, they sent people up to the mountain to try and find this plane to bring them relief. And by the time they got there, the people, two or three people who were in the plane, there were maybe only seven in there, had died of cold and exhaustion and exposure. So it was a sad tale and we were very respectful and it was a very interesting thing to see so many years later. Um, and th there's always light and shade and balance between good and bad. 
there are amazing things to see when you put yourself so far out of your comfort zone, somewhere I never thought I'd ever be able to, to see and achieve. Hiking the presidential ranges. You see me, I'm in the middle of that group at the top there with a blue jacket on. Um, that's a place called McAfee's Knob, um, which is like an outcrop on the side of a mountain, a very famous place on the trail that lots of people have their photograph taken. Um, this is my orange tent without its fly sheet, so you can let the air come in in the hot nights. We just pitched the tent like that in the woods. I pitch it, you know, alone, and people who are also hiking see tents, and they say, "Oh, can we camp with you tonight?" And we camp in a little area together. You always camp next to a stream, so you've got water, and um, often, sometimes they'll put basic wooden latrines in the woods, as like a pit in the ground, and they want you to congregate in these areas to sleep. It's not official, but they want you to, people who manage the trail, so that you don't destroy the wilderness you're walking through. They always want people to try and sleep in similar spots, maybe 20, 25 miles apart every day. It's a long way to walk in. Sunrises and sunsets were stunning. It was worth all of the pain. And if you don't give up when things are tough, you do get rewarded with pretty impressive stuff. Um, on the other side of the dark times. So on the right, I'm bridge jumping. I never thought I'd do bridge jumping. So we you hike through towns and villages sometimes, and in this particular town, there was a famous bridge, and there was a little white bit of tape after you climb over the railings, which shows you where the deep bit of the river is. Not something I'd have done in my other life, but off I went, jumped in. I was fine, as you can see. And then we used to go to thrift shops and find clothes to wear, so we'd be like weird, funky hikers wearing charity shop outfits for a little while. On the right with my friend from New Zealand, Josh, just people I met on the trail who become lifelong friends. We slept in a fire tower, which is a lookout point built of wood in the big forest. They build high, you go up metal staircases to get to the top, so that people, rangers, can look out and see if there are any fires or smoke in these huge thousand mile forests. So we would sneak up in them at night sleep and wake up to these beautiful sunrises. And sometimes you had to get canoed across rivers because they were too unsafe to wade across with your pack on your head. And in the middle at the bottom is me um, being taken across by the riverman so that I could hide from the other side. But it's not all roses and sunshine. There will always be hard days too, so the hike took a long time. It sounds fun, but when you get up every day and you just have to hike 25 miles or 20 miles or sometimes 30, for nearly seven months, that's a lot of getting up every day and walking through the forest. And you get very tired, and you get very miserable when it rains for days and days in a row, and you're soaking and everything's peeling, and you have blisters everywhere. You still have to carry your pack, you still have to make your food every night in your stove. And it's tough. Sometimes we night hiked to make up miles, which is you see me with my head torch on the right. Scary. I didn't like hiking at night with my head torch on. You see the eyes of the animals in the wood and the creaking and the crackling. Is it a bear? Is it a fox? Is it a deer? You just don't know. It's not walking like this at night. My head torch wouldn't do it by myself. I wanted to do it with my hiking friend. The second picture in on the left is what we call a privy, which is a bathroom with the pit dug. You can see that that's not a very private toilet whatsoever and has fallen apart and you had to climb up to use it. So there was no glamour associated with trail. You can't see the sign on the privy. Uh, it says, a bear has broken into this privy. Please lock the door when inside. So you'd go inside to the bathroom and you'd think, okay, I'm on the bathroom, but the bear might come in at any minute now. So the bears would just rip open the door and come in and see if you've got any food. The bears didn't really want to eat you. Black bears don't necessarily want to eat you. They will if they've been attacked or they feel threatened. But they want your food, so you have to be careful if you have a snack in your pockets, if you have sweets and treats in your pack, which you have to have for energy. The bears can smell that a very long way away, and they will track you and come after you and try and take your food from you. Or your backpack, if you put it down, they'll come out of the woods and take it. It was quite scary. Um, there was a lot of rain, then, then, then there was a big drought along the way, there was no water, the streams dried up. So lovely people called trail angels would come and drive from local towns, people who love the trail, because the trail's been there for 70 years, and it passes through the same towns every year, and people love the hikers. So they will get in their cars, fill up water bottles, drive out, hike them up into the forest, and leave them there when it's hot and there's a drought, so they know the hikers are getting enough water. And they've written on them, you're amazing, keep hiking, we love you. Just strangers you'll never meet doing glorious things. Sometimes they would 
get cans of Sprite and 7-Up and tie them in bags and tie them to the ropes that you'd cross the river with. So you'd be crossing the river, tie, 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 and you'd go, what's this? You'd lift up the rope that's in the river and there'd be a bag of 7 up. So you'd take one and be like, thank you, whoever left that there. Or Snickers hanging from trees they'd put in, you know, like a plastic thing so birds couldn't get them. They'd be little treats people would leave for you. Such an amazing community, the long-distance hiking community. And at the bottom, Things went really bad for me. So I was about four months in. And I kicked a rock really, really hard on a 30 mile day, desperate to get to town for a beer and a pizza, if I'm honest. I'd been in the woods for five or six days in the heat, and my friend said, Beer and pizza, beer and pizza, come on, girl, you can do another few miles. I said, I'm too tired. All right, I'll do it. I'll do it. So I kicked a rock running down the mountain in the last mile, like mile 30. I thought, oh my god, that hurt so, so, so much. That shocking pain, it's like a shock of white light in your head. I carried on. I carried on for another 100 miles or so, 150. It started to really, really hurt. So I went to the hospital and they x rayed it and they said, oh, it's just tendonitis. Ma'am, this is just tendonitis. You're going to be just fine. You can keep hiking, take a week off. I'm like, I don't have a week. Take a couple of days off, take some pills, you'll be fine. And I thought, right, I must be a wimp then, because it really hurts. Okay, I'll carry on, I'll take a couple of days off. So I did, maybe in total, 800 miles on this foot until, so that's when I went to the hospital, and the second one is, I've had enough. Can you tell from my face in that photo that I've had enough? I've had enough. It was very painful. Um, so I took, this was the day before I came off trail. I had to come off trail for, a month to let it rest, my tendonitis, because I was crying all day long, hobbling along like this, trying to keep up with the guys I was hiking with, still hiking 20, 25 miles a day with my heavy pack, up the mountain, scrambling. And I was thinking, I will not give up. I gave up 15 years of my life to pain. This is not my chronic pain. This will not stop me. I will carry on. And I did carry on for quite a long time until so I couldn't. These, bears, these baby bears are like trees, so I'm going to play it. You might not be able to see it from the floor. That's mama bear. And then there's baby bears under the tree, so I'm going to play it for about an hour and a half. Mama bear. Mama bear. Just call with me being baby bears right by you. I've watched it for about an hour and a half. Mama bear. So can you see the baby bear on the right hand side? They're eating nuts and berries off the tree and throwing down the bits left behind. Now they're bored. Mummy's called them. And you can see me. There's mum over there. And he looks over at me and he's like, is it safe to come down? What are you doing? Yep, yeah, and he goes and runs to mum. And there's mum on the left hand one. She now comes quite close to me, which made me quite frightened. Oh, look, they're both playing at the same time. Sorry if that makes you seasick. More babies up there. So you'd just be walking through the forest and stumble across bears eating. I don't know that I was ever trained of what to do with bears. It's not part of my childhood upbringing. Anyone here ever been trained of what to do when you meet your bear? No. Do you know what to do when you meet them? Shall I tell you? Depends what kind of bear you meet. I'm not sure if you guys are ever going to meet bears, but if it's a black bear, just be quiet, back away. It's all okay, the black bear doesn't want to attack you. He's going to run away because he's scared. Um, even if I used to hike around the corner, da -da 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 -da, singing my head off. And if you sing, they can hear you coming and they go away because they don't want to meet you. Sometimes they'll just be dozy and just dreaming and sitting on the trail. And you come round and I've made a bear go, Wah! before like that. And I've gone, Wah! and the bears run off in one direction and I've run off in the other direction because the black bear does not want to mess with you whatsoever. Last summer I went to Glacier National Park to highlight the Continental Divide Trail from Canada to Mexico. I didn't make it all the way. 3,000 miles, didn't do it. But there were grizzly bears. They're a different kettle of fish. They are terrifying. I had grizzly bear sprays on me, which you have to wait until when the grizzly bear charges, and they're like seven times bigger than me. If they want you, you're not going to scare them off. Mm -mm. If you go, whoa, like you would to a black bear, the grizzly bear will just go, oh, you want to play? Okay, I'm coming. So you, you have to make yourself big so that they think you're a threat, but you can't make threatening noises because they'll want to start on you then. And you have the spray because they then 
they charge like a bull, they stamp the floor, and then they start to like pretend they're gonna charge. It's called a bluff charge, where they bang the floor at you and they start to like and pretend they're gonna you charge. Have to stay it's still. A bluff charge. Because if they bang charge, the floor at you, you have to wait until they're a car to stay still away. Because if and then they you have charge, a spray and you spray on you the have floor, to wait till they're a like this pepper spray, spray. Really spray. And, and then then you have to spray the floor you because if you spray up in the air, like this it drifts up in the way. By the time the bird gets to it, it's spray gone. the floor. So you have to spray up in the air and then hope it's up and away. By the time the spray comes up in time, when the bird gets to it, it stings the bird's eyes and mouth, and the bird goes, oh, spray comes up in time. When the bird gets to it, it stings the bird's eyes and mouth. So I was very respectful of these bears, no just black bears. Um, but it was an incredibly yeah. beautiful experience. So I was very respectful of these bears, so knowing they were black bears. I came um, off trail for a month. Incredibly beautiful now, experience. I will not be defeated after everything so. I went through. So I rested the I came off trail for a month. And then I now, thought, I will not be defeated after everything I went through. All my so friends just finished it for a month. There's nobody on the trail I know. It's November, it's going to get cold. All my friends have finished I don't care. There's nobody on the trail I know. It's if November, I could get through that trauma that I went through, I, I could go back out there and hide from the cold. I will not. If I can get up. through that trauma, that's what I've proven to myself with my chronic illness, so I'm not going to give up because I will I'm not. So yeah. out I went. That's what I'm sorry about the my feet, but because so my foot still hurt quite a lot, so I was out on and slightly You know when you hurt yourself, you slightly move differently, or slightly move differently because you've got a sore shoulder. So I was walking slightly differently. It doesn't matter if you're only walking to the supermarket. But if you're walking so 25 miles a day, it matters how you walk. It doesn't walk. matter so if you're walking straight through. I've got all of those. If you're walking 25 miles a day, it matters how you do. So because I was walking straight through, I had all of those. Yeah, my um, whole feet were pure blisters. Yeah. So every morning I'd have to bandage them with moleskin and other bandages. Yeah. And my whole feet were pure blisters. My foot. Every morning I'd have to bandage them with moleskin and other bandages. I had another to hike to finish the trail. My foot. This foot. This foot and leg started to swell up. Really so here, yeah. so um, it is so chilly. There was like a polar vortex in November, late so November, here, unexpected, um, and everything so froze. Chilly. There was like everything. a polar vortex in November, November late November, unexpected. Barely anybody on the trail. And everything froze. Had a girl who slept in a hammock. I didn't. She would wake up in the morning. Barely anybody on the trail. The entirety of her hammock froze. And she would wake up in the morning. Barely anybody on the trail. The entirety of her hammock froze. And she would wake up in the morning. Barely anybody on the trail. The entirety of her hammock froze. And she would wake up in the morning. Barely anybody on the trail. The entirety of her hammock froze. And she would wake down. Icicles on her eyelashes. Icicles. Ice crystals around our nose and we tried to hide the green. Very different from the droughts and the heat and the humidity of when I first started out. Cooking and camping in the snow very different from the droughts and the heat and the humidity of when I first started out. And we had to carry more clothing because it was so cold. The pack is even heavier. Very, very cold and very uncomfortable. And we had to carry more clothing because it was so cold. The winter came and it got to probably later. December, and I did finish the trail, and I'll show you my finished picture in a minute, which makes me very proud. But I want to point this talk back to the idea of mindset and resilience. So mindset and resilience got me through those years of chronic illness, and it also got me through something incredible like the Appalachian Trail, against all the odds. And mindset, how you think about something, how you open up your head to look around problems, to find solutions, because there is always a solution, always a way through. And I can prove to you that mindset's everything, and I wouldn't recommend this, but when I got home from the trail, my doctor checked me over and then said, your foot looks very painful. It's like black, blue, swollen. I said, it is very painful. It's tendonitis, though. That's what they told me in America. <sighs> it's really painful. He said, let's x-ray it one more time, just to be sure. Oh, a broken foot in two places. My foot was broken and a displaced fracture in two places, and I hiked 850 miles with 30 pounds on my back over mountains with two broken bones in my foot because my mind told me that I could. Now, I'm not telling you that you should hike 800 miles across mountains with a broken foot, but what I am telling you is when you think you cannot, you probably can. Whatever we tell ourselves in our head, we will believe it and it will become a reality. So if you tell yourselves, I can't achieve that grade, I can't make friends with that person, I can't have that career, I can't have that job, then that's what will be the reality. If you tell yourself, 
I can be that person, I can be that track star, I can get up and sing and dance and join an acting club, I can be a singer, I can be a writer, cartoonist, really great friend, whatever it might be, you can if you believe you can. It's about the story you tell yourself in your head and you will go through really hard times in your life. We all do, it's the human condition, but it's about the skill set that you have that gets you through those times. Hope, things will always get better and then they might get worse again for a minute, but the sun will come up again and things will improve for you, no matter what you are going through. Have hope, be resilient, speak to people. Don't take people who tell you it won't work, give up. Don't take their word for it. Show them, show them what you can do because you can all do incredible things. And that was my incredible thing, well, my, one of my incredible things because I'm not stopping. I'm gonna keep doing incredible things. There are more obstacles ahead of me and places I wanna go, but I now know I can just climb over them. Might hurt, but on the other side is the next stage of my reality. That's not, I'm not a double person, that's me putting two, two photos side by side. Um, I just took my jacket off for one of them. Yeah, I did it. And this was the one thing I want to take uh, to share with you. This quote here, this bit of advice, never quit on a bad day. Because that was the piece of advice they would give you on trail if you wanted to quit. Soaked to the bone, sixth day in a row, blisters, mosquito bites, nearly stung on a rattlesnake. I miss my family, try to call your boyfriend from the trail, have an argument, then there's no reception, you can't call him back for three or four days, crying, crying, and you say, I hate this, I'm gonna quit. I hate this so much, I'm giving up, I hate this trail, what's the point? It's just walking, it's rubbish, I'm not doing it anymore. And the people who might be with you will say, okay, sure, this is terrible, you're having a really bad time. You can quit, we'll help you quit. We'll call you a cab, we'll take you to the train station, we'll make sure you can get home. But you don't get to quit today. You have to wait until your next good day. Then you can quit. Because you're never allowed to quit on a bad day. You're only allowed to quit when quit. your next feels you're good. You're never allowed then to no quit stop you on a bad day. You're only you're allowed, allowed to say. quit when your next feel okay. good. And then no one will stop you. Oh, I'll wait till the next good day, but then won't be a good day. And on the next good day, I'm going home. Oh, then fine. I'll wait till the next good day. How do you think I felt on the next good day? Then the next good day, I want to go home. No, exactly. So whenever you want to quit something, club, school, a friendship, a, fa a relationship, an aspiration, whatever it is, you're going to have a bad day, and you can always quit. But please promise me that you'll wait till your next good day to quit, and you won't quit, and you'll be really glad that you didn't. Thank you very much for listening to my story. I really appreciate it. And I'm now open to any questions if you might have any at all. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. That was a lot of talking from me. Thank you for taking it all in. Anybody have any questions? Um, yeah, hi. Hi, how are you? Very well. Um, I have two questions. Sure. The first question is, how do you manage not to be dumb? <laughs> So hitchhiking is a dangerous thing to do, and actually in the US there's a lot of women who disappear hitchhiking, so it's a really contentious issue, especially native women who aren't counted for and who aren't looked after properly by the system. But um, So I'm very respectful of the fact that it's not something that you say lightly when you go hitchhiking, so thank you for the question. So uh, there are a number of really clear rules that I followed for myself because I was very frightened of hitchhiking and I wouldn't do it anywhere else. So, uh, you're along the trail, which means the people who drive up and down those roads along the trail have seen hikers hitchhiking for a really long time, so are very familiar with looking after and looking out for hitchhikers um, who have backpacks. I didn't look like a regular hitchhiker. You have a big, stinky backpack, you have poles, and you're filthy. So everybody knows that you're a hiker. So good people are happy to stop for you because they know you're a hiker, whereas if you just look like a regular person hitchhiking somewhere else, they might never put you hitchhiking. Because around. they know you're a hiker, the whereas if you just look like a regular person you hitchhiking look like somewhere else, I they might try and look like somebody else. Around. Else. Around. I would hitchhike the second thing is, is a woman when you, when um, I put I would not try and get with somebody else, else um, hitchhiking together, especially as a group of two or three of us. Um, is, I would say the thing that I would do is, uh, even if we were together, uh, I would like to do with three of us, is I would say to the person before I get in, and send it to 
and my family, family so that they know it's just the way I protect myself. And if the person driving the car gives any impression that they're not comfortable with that, then I would say, actually, you know what, I'm fine, we're still waiting for somebody else anyway, and we wouldn't all fit in your cars, and they can go. Because if anybody's uncomfortable with the idea that you're taking a picture of their license plate, then they're not somebody that you wanted to get in a car with anyway. And also, don't be afraid to say, no, thank you. You can feel the vibe of the car. You open the door, someone leans out of the car to, to say, hey, get in. Sometimes a guy, you see an empty, like an open beer can in the car because some people out in the boonies, you know, in the middle of nowhere, drink, drive, farmers, whatever, and you say, no thanks, I'm good. I don't want to get in the car with a drink driver or I'm waiting for somebody else, actually. So I was very clear and free about saying no. And I hiked with somebody, I hitchhiked with somebody and I had clear rules for myself. But still, it's a dangerous thing, so I don't recommend it unless you've done your research and you're comfortable with it. Yeah, second question. Yeah, my second question. Um, I mean, we're here in a room for the most part with like young Arab Middle Eastern girls. Yes. Um, we're for the most part with like young Arab Middle Eastern, Middle Eastern girls. Yes. Yes. Um, yes. Where we have you lots of cultural barriers that we have to overcome. Yes. Yes. What advice, you know, you as a woman who had to do this, I must like imagine that was hard. Yes. But what advice would you have for the young girls who are here? What kind of barriers, for as an example, would you say that you're facing with this kind of adventure, for example? What kind of, um, I think there's lots of social barriers, um, just the, the general perception that maybe like a young girl, maybe possibly someone who wears a cadet will not be able to do things. Um, it's not very easy for you know a girl like me or anyone else to maybe sit in a cab for like long nights with possibly other people around yeah. things like that. Um, and that's a very good question, and I don't think there's a simple answer, but what I do think is that something like a trail community, you find all kinds of people out there, all kinds of di different like genders, different backgrounds, different religious beliefs, and it's an incredibly accepting community where people go because they are open-minded and they want to be in a freer community where it doesn't matter what people look like, you know, they're trying to break away from the strict confines of society. I found myself nervous being a woman out there alone a lot of the time, but I, I, I didn't have to worry because the men that I met out there were incredibly respectful. People you didn't know and you'd never meet again would automatically, if you were in camp, give you space and distance, you know, avert their eyes all the time if they thought that you might be doing something personal, allow you to put your tent, give you the best spot so that you could be concealed and away from everybody. People won't try and get in your business if they, if they can tell that you want to be private, they will absolutely allow you to be private. If you're wearing hijab, you can wear the hijab on trail and nobody will mention it or say anything about it. I think, I, do, I, I think that research is really important. I think doing your research about what the trail is like, what the trail communities are like, how they will feel, how accepting they will be of anybody. We hiked with um, a gay man who was really concerned about going through some of the more conservative states. So he had to do, he did his research, he made sure that he was safe in the ways that he needed to be. I think being prepared ahead of time is, is really good. But I don't think that, um, I don't think that the trail community precludes anybody from being. It's nature, it's the outdoors, it's where we all belong and should be able to feel, feel safe. And I think um, in the UK we have the hiking hijabi, a woman who hikes all of the trails in the mountains wearing a hijab, very proud about that, about inclusion and acceptance. And I'm a huge advocate for that too. So, I mean, I'd be very interested to, to keep in touch and see how I could support that in any way or put people in touch with the Haikin Jabi or other people who are, who have, you know, culturally different from what you're seeing in the main and these American trails to get out there and reclaim the outside for yourselves as well. Great, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Is there, like, um, places you stop to buy, like, food and stuff? For food? Yeah. Yes. So in some places, like the hiking through New York, the section of New York, not New York City, but New York State, there would be Italian delis every day that you'd hike past by the trail because it's much more populated. So you'd maybe get a meatball sub or whatever as you're hiking through. Other places, like in Maine, you'd sometimes have to carry like a 100 mile wilderness. 10 days worth of food in your bag because there was nowhere to get food. Mm -hmm. So it would be gas stations. Sometimes you'd catch a ride into towns even a bus or a taxi to go to supermarkets like big Walmart and you fill up with loads of stuff. But you'd buy stuff in huge boxes like 20 rice meals and then you'd buy it together and split it up between you and you'd all have a little bit of different flavours and stuff like that. So you'd buy stuff in supermarkets and gas station food is not very good for you. 
So the nutrition that you need on trail, the calories are so high that you end up having to eat food that's kind of rubbish for your system to get the calories in. Yeah. Or you buy a little olive oil bottle, some kind of oil, and carry it with you the whole way, or butter sticks. If it was cold enough, they didn't melt everywhere. And you just melt them into your food at night, pour olive oil over everything to get the calories that you need. You know, I still finish the trail like two stone lighter and the most muscular I've ever been in my life, even though I was eating three or four Snickers a day. Just the energy you need. Yeah, good question. How much like hours did you like walk every day? Another good question. So I'd get up maybe 6 a.m., start hiking by 7, 7.30, and you finish when it got dark. So maybe you'd hike to 4 or 5. So maybe 10 hours of hiking a day would be wow. standard. Yeah, and you'd average maybe 2.5 miles an hour. Some people hike 3, um, but any, it's much harder than a flat trail because you're having to slow down and stop and sometimes take your pack off to push it up above rocks so you can climb rocks and get up and uh, come down on big rocky mountain sides. So it wasn't as simple as just walking along. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Yes. Hi. Um, Hi. I have two questions. Sure. Um, first question is, uh, like everyone has different types of fears, a fear of doing something or a fear of like what ifs, you know, the questions come up. How, how did you like maintain to not let the fear become your barrier of doing things while hiking? Um, very relevant question, thank you. I have some big fears about being on my own in the out deep outdoors. So I didn't always cope with it very well. I, before I went on the trail, so I had quite, um, quite a traumatic incident where I was attacked in my late teens by a man, and um, it was really bad. And it took me a long time to come to terms with it, didn't talk about it for a long time, it was a stranger. And before I went on this trail three years ago, two years ago, I went to therapy before it to speak to somebody and say, this is my big fear. I'm really afraid that I'll meet a man on trail and nobody else will be around and he'll be scary and he'll hurt me because that happened to me a long time ago. And I have this, still have this fear of being alone outside in the, in the woods. So this, the therapist helped me because I wanted to go. I didn't want the fear to stop me. I was angry that it had happened to me and given me this fear in my body. <laughs> um, and I didn't want that to be a barrier. It didn't feel fair. So I was working to overcome it. And I just pushed myself out there and thought, okay, I did all the research. Statistically, you're more likely to get attacked in a parking lot in London, like 10 times more likely than if you are in the woods. People don't go deep in the woods and sit behind trees for days waiting for girls on their own to come. They're more likely to be, you know, like around the corner in your local town. So I reassured myself with the cold, hard facts and statistics, which are great. They don't often help. Facts don't often help fears, do they? Because fears are rooted in our system. And I just went and I expressed myself when I felt nervous. I made sure I had things I needed. I had an SOS beacon that had GPS, so when there was no phone service, I could still press the beacon and tell people where I was. And I had to have belief in people, in the goodness of people. Um, and I actually had a terrifying panic attack, my first one ever, on trail at night when the guy I was hiking with, a friend of mine, had disappeared. So we'd got to the top of a mountain, he got there ahead of me, um, it was getting dark, and uh, <clears throat> he was faster than me, and we were, had planned to meet at the bottom of the mountain on the other side of camp in the same area. Um, and when I got to the top of the mountain, there was a couple coming the other way, hiking on a day hike, finishing their day hike, and I said, have you seen my friend? He's very tall, big beard, and they said, oh yes, he was up here about an hour ago. I was like, oh that makes sense because he's much faster than me, he's like six foot four, so he's got long legs, and he always waits for me, you know. I said, great, thank you. So I carried on and hiked down the mountain. Got the one stream, we normally waited at streams where we cleared our water out together and then he'd go off fast again. Check I was okay and off he'd go. No, he wasn't there. Next stream, he wasn't there. And it was getting dim, dusky, like the crickets were out, no one around. Hadn't, hadn't been by myself at night this whole trail so far. It was like six weeks in. Finally got to the other side of the campground with the space we were supposed to be at thinking he'll be there, he'll be there, he'll be there. I was like, wasn't there. And I had a horrific panic attack, a flashback from the bad thing that happened to me. And I was convinced some people were in the trees trying to get me, um, because I learned later that when you have a panic attack, you're not taking in enough oxygen, and you, you, know, you're, you're, you get tunnel vision, which gives you like paranoia and hallucinations for a moment. So I ended up running through the forest, shouting and screaming and crying that somebody was after me. No one could hear me, because there was no one around. 
It was just in my imagination, it was just fear, like you say, fear. Um, and I finally came out at a road crying in the dark. And there were other hikers on the other side who were hiking in the other direction. And they were sitting down there eating their food with headlamps on. And I came out screaming and they thought I'd been attacked. So they ran over. One was a paramedic in real life. He was like, I think you've hit your head. And I said, no, I, I couldn't speak, actually. I was so terrified. They calmed me down, looked after me, and I was fine. But it was terrifying. So I tell you that because that was my fear, actually. My fear, my fear of being attacked again was probably never going to happen. My fear of being that afraid again is what I was really afraid of. And I went through that terrible terror, had the panic attack, and after that I thought, well, that's the, that was what I was afraid of, that, that feeling, and I've lived through it, and I'm not dead, and I'm okay, and I could go home now and give up, or I could just carry on knowing that I can manage that level of fear and come out the other side of it and be okay. And so I did. So I prepared myself, I did get very frightened. I, I'm very happy to tell a story about how brave I am, but that's useless unless you also are honest with people about how you messed up, how afraid you got, the bits that were terrible. But once you go through those terrible bits, what's on the other side is a new refreshing bravery and a new refreshing understanding of what you're capable of. Um, but always still have the GPS beacon in case you need it, I would still say. But whatever fear you have is manageable. It might not feel like it, but it is. Yeah. Did you have a second question? Yes. The second question was, when you finished your journey at the very end, yeah. how did you feel and what was the next thing you wanted to do? What, uh, what came out of all of this for you? Okay, so when I finished the journey, that's a really, I love that, because uh, it's not what people expect. So I expected before I did this that when I ended the trail, I would be like, yeah, nailed it, you know, like stick the flag in it, conqueror. Mm -hmm. I felt nothing like that because the journey was so long and so much was learned. I, you know, my heart was wrenched open by the forest. And I don't mean like in a heartbreak sense, it also was for heartbreak, but just with, you cannot walk in silence in the trees for six months without them taking you to pieces. Nature just takes you to pieces. Your own mind, that level of silence without phones, jobs, appointments, car journeys to get to, it's just you in your head. So everything you ever worried about, everything you squash down, everything you deny and tuck away in little pockets in your body and your brain, it just creeps out. So when I finished, I felt cleansed. I felt like, I felt humble. I cried. I, cr I put my hands on the dirt at the end and I thanked Mother Nature, the world God, the universe for allowing me to be part of something so humbling. I was just so humbled. It could bring me to tears now, having had that experience. Being in nature, meeting so many kind people, putting your faith in humanity and in the great outdoors. Yeah. So you never, it's interesting, you see people uh, in pictures at the sign, Katahdin, where I started giving it like, woo, but you speak to them and they don't feel like, did it, they just feel like, whoa, I see the world, I'll, I'll never be the same again. This trail has broken me down and built me back up again with a new gratefulness for being alive. Um, and what it led me to was to immediately plan, I was like, oh, my foot's broken, dang it, have to rest it for a couple of months, and then I planned, booked my flights to walk the Pacific Crest Trail, which is the other side of America, uh, it's 2,600 miles, and then after that, uh, in the November, I booked to hike the length of New Zealand, the two islands, the North Island and the South Island, called the Te Roa Trail. Booked all the flights, paid for it all. Now I'm just going to be a hiker, look what I can do. And then COVID came and I couldn't do anything. Had lost it all. Um, lockdown. So uh, lockdown happened just after I came home. So I thought, if I can't travel with my body, I'm going to travel with my mind. And I wrote the book about the adventure. So I lived the adventure again, told my story about overcoming chronic pain, told my story about all the people I met on the trail, the journey, the wild fun time and the resolution and the joy, and put it on paper. I sent it to a publisher and an agent. They said, yes, yes. And then that got published. And uh, now I continue to write, to do more hikes, to speak for schools, to write curriculum, to write programs and courses for especially women who want to build the confidence to get outdoors and to feel as brave and courageous and warrior-like as we really are inside. Thank you. You're welcome. Uh, hi. So first of all, I'd like to say thank you so much for sharing your story. It was truly brilliant. 
thank you. I was also curious about what you were doing, what you did when you finished the trade. Yeah. But also, you mentioned that I think you mentioned that it was seven months long, which is mind mind blowing to me. And I'm sure there were days where it was really easy to give up, and it was like so hard, and it was really easy to give up. I know I already touched on that, but like. When you felt like, were there days where you felt like, okay, this is enough, maybe I can stop now? Or what did you do to... I did, I really did have those days for different reasons. For the fact that my body hurt, I missed my family and friends, I had my heart broken, I, um, I got bored. All of those things happened. And every time I felt like giving up, I would think, well, sometimes I'd take a day off and I'd have what's called a zero. So a zero on trail is where you hike zero miles. So you get to a town or you put your tent up in a nice place and you say, I'm not going anywhere today, I'm zeroing. Or you have a nero, which is a nearly zero, where you do like five miles into town and stay there for the rest of the day. Sometimes that's all you need to boost up your energy levels, to start to feel positive, to have a shower, to dry your clothes, to wash your hair, clean your fingernails, everything that's dirty and disgusting. You feel fresh and you're like, okay, it was just that I was filthy and tired, needed some good food, some salad, and a good sleep and a bed, now I can go on. So you have to try that first. And the next thing is I thought, okay, I could quit. I could quit easily. But what happens in three days time when I, but day one, yeah, I don't care, I quit. Day two, oh, I've had a good night's sleep, so glad I quit, this is great. Day three, what am I doing now? What am I doing now that was so worth me giving up having come 600, 800, 900 miles towards my goal. Am I doing something now, now I've, now I've had a few days away, that was really worth giving up this monumental task? And I think, no, 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 I feel terrible. I'm just gonna carry on and hope it gets better. But I also had that deep reservoir of resilience I built up through all those years of chronic pain when I nearly gave up and took my own life. I nearly did that terrible thing um, and never did because I always thought tomorrow will be better. Tomorrow will be better. I owe it to myself to hold on. And so on trail I did the same. Tomorrow will be better. And usually tomorrow is better. That's what we should all tell ourselves when we're having those dark days. Yeah. I found it really inspiring. Thank because, you. Um, you what message would you tell to find nature, sort of some connection with other people who like the same thing? So there will always be people out there to meet even if you don't have really any friends that love hiking. Oh, oh, that's good. I don't know. Probably something like, yeah, don't give up. Things get better. Things always get better. And probably something about you have no idea what you're capable of yet. And hopefully my future, future self can look back and tell me that now. I've got no idea what I'm still capable of doing. Maybe there'll be a film. Maybe I'll write book two. Maybe I'll hike around the whole world. Maybe I'll write a program for women that helps get women outside that people use everywhere and feel liberated and strong and brave. And that women don't have to feel nervous about being outdoors anymore or have any fear about judgment or that we're weaker or lesser than or less capable than anybody else because we're not we are formidable we are a force women are superb so um yeah i tell myself those kinds of things yeah yeah and something about i i would say Shh, don't tell her the foot's broken or she'll have to get off trail <laughs> i'd keep that a secret anything else from anyone yeah you ever miss it? pardon me Oh, a lot, a lot, a lot, a lot. There is no freedom like it. And there's no sense of peace like it because it was simple. Every day I had to just think about where will I put my tent that's safe? Is there clean water? Do I have enough food to eat? I didn't have to think about anything else. So I learned that the simplicity of life is, is the key to happiness. I haven't been able to replicate that. When I got back, I tried to be super simple, but life fills the space that you buy some stuff, shoes I don't need, a dress I don't wear, jeans I don't wear, you know, appointments to see people I don't really want to go to, birthday parties, people, friends I should get rid of that aren't healthy for me, but I keep them because it's too hard to have that conversation. So suddenly life clutters up with stuff and noise and things. And I need to remember that simplicity is essential. And the things that we are told in life that are the most important things, money, career, success, fame, all those things that we think are really important, 
they're not. They might feel important because of the way we've built the world we live in, but really important things are connection, self-love, peace with who you are, knowing kindness, kindness for each other, non-judgment of what people look like or who they are or where they come from. Those things create a great world and respectful, being respectful of nature. I'm not a hippie, but being in the woods that long definitely made me appreciate that we are all from nature. We are all animals. We are from nature, this gift that we've been given on this planet and that we mustn't neglect the world we live in because it is the very foundations of everything that we are. So I miss it because those things were at the front of my mind every day and now they've slipped backwards because we live in a capitalist world where everything is bye-bye, do-do, we're busy, busy, busy. And yeah, that's not really what makes us happy. So yes, I miss it. So I'm going to go back out again soon. <laughs> More hiking. Yeah. Um, I think being outdoors in nature will help with your mental health hugely. So even if you only have 10 minutes a day to get outside to put your feet on the ground or to go and look at a tree or to have the sun on your face and walk around the block and notice the birds, those kind of things might sound cliched, but they will do wonders for your mental health when you can't go further and you don't feel, you feel your freedoms are curtailed. Also learning, learning is a really important thing to help you feel grounded. Learn about the place you're in, learn about the animals around you, the environment, learn about mental health practices to help keep you well. Um, those kind of things so keep learning keep in touch with the natural world and you know mindfulness meditation keep yourself focused on inner quiet inner calm um, because the world is a noisy crowded chaotic place and with covid everything is so unsettled so it's really good to bring yourself in know who you are make sure you're being kind make sure you're learning and make sure that you make sure that you have purpose what do you want to do? What is your purpose? Every day, what is my purpose today? What do I want to achieve today? What, will, what contribution can I give to the world today? Because what you put out, it comes back. So if you wake up and you're like, the world sucks, everything sucks, can't be bothered, I'm too tired, everything's rubbish, then you're just sending out a wave of eh, and it will come back a bigger wave of eh. But if you send out, I see someone struggling with a bag, I'm going to help, I'm going to hold the door open, I'm going to call a friend who I don't think is doing so well and just say, hey, thinking about you. And then back that comes in a ripple of goodness to you and everything gets lifted. There's a saying that we have at home in Cornwall um, where there's lots of boats. You may have heard it, it's probably global, which is a rising tide lifts all boats. So when the tide comes in, it doesn't just lift one person's boat, it lifts everybody's boat. So our job is to lift everybody's boat, not just our own boat, because our own boat won't come up by itself. Everybody's boat has to come up a bit for your boat to come up. So try and lift someone's boat every day and you'll sleep at night a little bit better, I think. Thanks, everyone. It's been an absolute pleasure talking to you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> Her story really made me want to test my limits and see how far I can go. So I really want to thank her for taking the time to share her experience with us. Miss Muller's story really touched me and inspired me because doing this uh, hike for six, seven months is really hard and not everyone could do it. And I appreciate and I get, I'm inspired by her braveness after what she went through for the past 15 years.